In the Himalayan foothills, Kathmandu long has been a crossroads. Its streets and holy places filled with travelers en route to a thousand destinations many may never reach. Watched by the gods, some go to market to sell or buy. Some seek to earn a higher form in their next reincarnation. Some climb the steep steps to Nirvana, hoping to escape the tumults of daily life. Sometimes the destinations are only disguised beginnings. For Sir Edmund Hillary, first conqueror of Mount Everest, his greatest journey would only begin at the summit. traverse not only the great landforms of Earth, but a less visible geography, the private landscapes of one man's passage through the years. At last, among the long, isolated Sherpas of the Kumbu region south of Everest, it would bring a new challenge, a new adventure, hardly 20 miles from where his journey began. Today, Hillary is a folk hero in the Kumbu. With ceremonial scarves or katas, the Sherpa children honor not the great Sahib who climbs mountains, but the friendly giant who has brought them their first glimpses of a world they never knew. It has been a trade of sorts. In changing their lives, Hillary has changed his own. In the Kumbu highlands of Nepal, each dawn is a discovery. Again, the peaks emerge. Amadablam, Kantega, Tamsirku, Everest. Silent sentinels of Earth's highest mountains, the Himalayas. In the Sherpa villages of Kunde and Kumjung, by ageless habit, yaks and goats are sent to stony pastures, and the juniper smoke from a hundred scattered fires carries morning prayers to the gods. At 13,000 feet, the gods are never far away. Formed 40 million years ago by the collision of the Indian landmass and the Eurasian continent, Nepal is a country set on edge. Here, near Everest, Tibetan Sherpas long ago found sanctuary. Here, for centuries, they lived in rigorous isolation, an island in time. One man has become a major instrument of change, bringing both blessings and danger. With his son, Peter, Sir Edmund Hillary has returned this way many times. But this year holds a special meaning. It is the 30th anniversary of the first conquest of Everest.
I get quite a thrill every time I come back to these two main Sherpa villages. There's so much here that's pleasantly familiar. There's also the thought of soon being reunited with so many old friends. Again, they walk the village lanes, welcomed by the greeting of clasped hands and murmured namaste. Already fields are being prepared and planted with grains or potatoes for the short upland growing season. Across a wall bounds an old and irrepressible friend, Fudorje, Hillary's companion on many a climb. <laughs> Everywhere, young life explores a world made new. It is spring. At last, father and son enter the house that long ago became a second home. Oh, my goodie. Namaste. Very good to see you. Namaste. 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 In this house, I can always be sure of a warm welcome and a cup of Tibetan tea. Over the years, my family and I have spent much time here with Mingma Sering and his wife, Angduli, and they are still my closest Sherpa friends. In daily tasks, Angduli endures. Having lost eight of 11 children, she eagerly welcomed the Hillary family as her own. Upon the wall hang snapshots. Fragments of life captured long ago. Hillary's daughters, Belinda and Sarah. His wife, Louise, and the children. Young Peter with protective God. Playful Belinda, the youngest child. Ah, thank you, Aunt Dobby. Uh, we uh, keep a tea, much lagging. Children say all sweet tea. Sweet tea, so maybe lagging, maybe not lagging. Ah, lagging. <laughs> now a painter, surviving son Temba, remains a victim of iodine deficiency, once common in the Kumbu. Hey, Temba. Ah, what's that? What's that? Who? Tang Bochi. Ah, what's that? I'm the blum. I'm the blum. Oh, what's that? Yeti. 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 Aha. And what's this big one? Chumaluma? Chumaluma. Everest. Pivot on which so many destinies have turned, it was Everest that once joined the widely separated lives of Hillary and Tenzing Norge, his Sherpa partner on the historic climb. Now, amid the peaks on the trail to Everest, they meet again. Still strong at 69, Tenzing and his daughter Deki have come from Darjeeling to join the anniversary festivities. Oh, Tenzing! Ah, good to see you. Oh, hi, Deki. How are you? Very nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 Long time, Tenzing. Good to see you. Yeah, Tenzing, did you have a good walk up? Oh, very well. Good. Uh -huh. Fine, good. thank you. In Britain today, there will be a more formal celebration, but Hillary and Tenzing have chosen to come here, not only to be honored, but to honor the families of so many Sherpas who have risked and often lost their lives on many an expedition. heroes pause to honor each other, look back to the victory they shared. 
Remote, seemingly beyond the reach of human effort, the towering mass of Everest at mid-century had defeated all attempts to reach the summit. Then, as Nepal opened to foreigners, assaults at last were possible from the south. In the British expedition of 1953, guide Tenzing Norgay, already veteran of five failed attempts, would be teamed with Hillary, who earlier had sighted a possible route via the South Col. With the return of the first assault team, the challenge was passed to Hillary and Tenzing. The earlier team had reached a point hardly 300 feet below the summit. Now, exhausted and frozen, there was somber evidence of the tests that lay ahead. But storm intervened. Only after a night racked by winds could Hillary and Tenzing at last climb the icy blade to the summit. There they left in the snow a bar of chocolate and some biscuits. At a lower camp, the main party waited in growing suspense while leader John Hunt scanned the ridges and ice falls above. Then, at last, the returning climbers appeared, led by a teammate, lifting his thumb in a sign of triumph. the triumph was shared only with comrades. Then word flashed to the world. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. Mount Everest has been conquered by members of the British expedition. The news reached London in a message to the Times. It said that Mr. E.P. Hillary, a New Zealander, and Tenzing Bhutia, a Sherpa, had reached the summit last Friday, May 29th. The message added, all is well. In London, the coronation of a queen now was marked by a fitting tribute. For a new Queen Elizabeth, an obscure New Zealand beekeeper had set a flag in high thin air, past a boundary never crossed by man. Quickly knighted by the queen, Sir Edmund soon pledged loyalty to another lady, Louise, the young musician who became his wife. Yet domestic bliss soon would be exchanged for the wintry wastes of Antarctica. There, Hillary would lead a caravan of modified farm tractors to the South Pole, setting up supply depots for the first Antarctic crossing. Hero to the world, symbol of high adventure, his life would become a continuing odyssey, seeking new challenges around the globe. Sometimes, with the indomitable Louise on less spectacular expeditions in New Zealand or the Alaskan wilderness, he discovered the new adventure of watching his children grow. But always Hillary came back to Nepal. Long a forbidden kingdom locked from the world, Nepal had barely 200 miles of road when at last opened to foreigners in 1949. Its few vehicles, machines, and even grand pianos were brought over the southern ridges on the backs of men. Its terraced uplands built by the labor of centuries were joined by a labyrinth of trails on which astonishing burdens were carried by the hardy hill folk or their caravans of yaks.
Later, each return of the family would become a journey of discovery, particularly for Louise, whose light-hearted accounts of their travels soon became best-selling books. Learning the country by climbing it, the children were taken by their father to see the great peak that had changed his destiny and theirs. For the first time, 12-year-old Peter would glimpse the mountain that one day would draw him like an inescapable challenge. With deepening regard for the warm-hearted Sherpas, the Hillarys eagerly lent a hand wherever needed, opened the door to a culture distant from their own origins. On a mountainside at Tommy, not far from the Tibetan border, they helped build a supporting wall for a Buddhist monastery. Its new leader was a 12-year-old boy, believed to be the reincarnation of a previous head lama, or Rinpoche. When I first went to the Himalayas, my major interest really was in climbing mountains. I got to know the local people, the Sherpas, and enjoyed them very much. And by spending time in the villages, it became impossible for me not to realize that there were so many things lacking, there were so many things that we took for granted in our society that they simply didn't have. And because I was very fond of my Sherpa friends, I had this sort of nagging worry all the time. Shouldn't we be trying to do something about the future of the Sherpas? and to help them to withstand the changes that were likely to take place. Around Hillary, often watching, were the beautiful Sherpa children, open, quick to laugh, endlessly inventive in play. Yet untaught, their innocence one day could become a prison. In all of the Kumbu, there was not a school to help them grow. He would always remember the words of a village leader, our children have eyes they are blind. And it was then at that particular occasion that I decided, well, instead of sort of thinking about it for years and talking about it, maybe I should try and do something about it. Abruptly, Sir Edmund Hillary became a part-time carpenter. Drawing help from contributors in New Zealand and the United States, he formed the Himalayan Trust to support the program. Today, still building after more than two decades, he has completed and staffed no fewer than 22 schools across the Khumbu. We have a good experienced team to do the job. My brother Rex is a builder by trade back in New Zealand, and he's come over here quite a few times to help on these projects. But without Mingma's organization and authority amongst the Sherpas, I could have done nothing. The patterns of construction have changed little since the building of the first school in 1961. Some children help, some children watch, some children imitate. For some, classes have already begun. This is the thing I've always liked about the Sherpas. They always are prepared and know what they can do. 
They know that they don't have money, but they have the strength of their hands. In days gone by, even my own children, Peter, Sarah and Belinda, used to work in with the local children, carrying rocks and carrying chunks of timber, and I really think they enjoyed it. It's quite exciting to watch a school rise up from its foundations and to see the rock I used to climb being fashioned into schoolhouse walls. A rudimentary structure, unheated, dependent on natural light, the new school at Chondrikaka is a center of village pride. Quickly the people gather, bringing bottles of chong, the local spirits, for the celebration. I always feel a slight degree of apprehension about get-togethers like these. Any Sherpa gathering tends to become a somewhat festive occasion, with the local beer and spirits flowing rather freely, and mostly in my direction. And it's really quite a challenge to survive these functions in an upright position. We hope that many more children will come to school and get good learning and uh, we will always be prepared uh, to help uh, with uh, further uh, expansion when more and more children come. On behalf of the Himalayan Trust and all those who have helped uh, build this uh, school, I have much pleasure now in uh, declaring the school open. For the first time, the children enter the still empty classroom. Here in this vacancy, each will embark on a new journey of discovery, find new mountains to climb. Today, across the Kumbu, the school bells ring, many the empty oxygen flasks used by Hillary and other climbers. Over the highland ridges, more than a thousand Sherpa children hurry to class each day. Some to schools more than a three hour journey from home. At Kumjung, Hillary remains close to its day-to-day -day activities, still enjoys visiting the first school he ever built, watching children draw pictures of a wider world they have never seen outside a book. Largest of Kumbu schools, with an enrollment of nearly 300, Kumjung has a proud record of outstanding students, some already entering leadership roles in Nepal. The 
soccer team, of course, remains invincible to lowland teams who quickly struggle for breath at 13,000 feet. But schools are only part of a wider effort by Hillary and his associates. Under his direction, three landing strips have been carved on the mountainsides, ending forever the centuries-long isolation of the Sherpas. In the mysterious symbols printed on the cargo, Passing children sometimes try to imagine the wonders of the world from which it came. Built by Hillary, scattered clinics and two hospitals at last provide medical care and have brought a new awareness among the Sherpas that smoky dwellings and lack of sanitation cause many of their chronic maladies. At Kunde, even the local Lama has found a new trust in modern medicine. In a region where formerly half the youth died before 20, there has been a dramatic improvement in the treatment of children's afflictions and a corresponding drop in the mortality rate. For some, the cures seem nearly miraculous. Here, a boy whose hearing has been severely impaired since birth can hear the full wonder of sound for the first time. But as Hillary learned during the building of Faflu Hospital in 1975, preparations for errands of mercy are sometimes of little use. Eagerly awaiting the arrival of his wife Louise and young Belinda from Kathmandu, he learned that both had been killed in the crash of their plane shortly after takeoff. For Hillary, that day was darkness. The beginning of a long journey across a private wasteland without compass or place to rest. to do apart from go on building the hospital and then later we went back to Kumbu and spent time with Mingma and Angduli and the various other friends and that was it and they you know had all helped a bit Shaken, Hillary went back to work, building new classrooms, adding to others. That was a bit old, gee. Yeah. Well, I think it'd be better to do a proper job with it. Mm -hmm. You'll have to put uh, other frameworks in, won't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Now at Nomche Bazaar with his brother Rex, he studies the damage of time and weather to a school built years ago, draws plans for needed repairs on its structure. I think uh, we're going to lease it soon better than timber for me for some time. Still Hillary's trusted Sirdar, or foreman, Ming Matsering jokes over the division of labor in providing the lumber, who will cut and who will carry. Helping carry. Are they helping carry? Yes. 
Is this okay? Yeah, that's great. Sounds okay. A big help. Yeah, there are good fellow with cutting, giving. Yeah. Then they're cherry. Yep. Drawn closer by tragedy, Hillary and Peter each feel a renewed awareness of the risk that lies in every human attachment. Now veteran climbers both, often in personal peril, each has seen close friends and companions lost on mountain walls. Even Peter was nearly sacrificed on the soaring altar of Ama de Blam. Struck by an avalanche high in its icy wall, severely injured and climbing equipment swept away, Peter nearly died in the two days before he finally could be lowered to safety. For Hillary himself, the summits have a new and poignant meaning. He can never again return to those icy heights. Several times in recent years, he has suffered critical attacks of cerebral edema, or altitude sickness. Twice, in delirium, he has had to be led or carried from the thin upper air to lower altitudes to save his life. Today, the man who first climbed Everest must remain below 14,000 feet. But today, with Peter and Mingma, he will press the barrier view at a distance the summit on which he stood 30 years ago. For at last, Peter is ready to answer the summons he first felt as a 12-year-old boy, staring in awe at the mountain his father had climbed. Already, Peter has begun preparations for an attempt on Everest by its formidable West Ridge. A geologic accident that became the highest point on Earth, Everest has long been a challenge to Western man. But to the Sherpas, the peaks were something else. Migrating from Tibet several centuries ago, the Sherpas found an endlessly changing world of mist and stone, where peaks and trees and streams appeared and vanished with magical swiftness. Quickly, their imaginations populated the landscape with gods, demons, and spirits of every kind. Even the trees were sometimes believed to be the dwelling place of sacred beings. In a continuing dialogue with the invisible or disguised powers around them, they have given prayer a thousand forms, a thousand means of transmission, written on hand-turned cylinders and water wheels printed on prayer flags and banners waving in the wind. Inscribed on shrines or chotens. Engraved on stone tablets or manis. Even on rocks and rivers and trailside boulders. Committed to the elements, it is hoped that the prayers will reach their protective gods. The sun diffuses the fading prayer, rain spreads it through the rivers, wind carries it to the heavens. Surrounded by prayer in life, Sherpas are followed by prayer even in death. Into the ear of the dead, the dying, or those soon to die, a monk chants passages from the Tibetan Book of the Dead to guide the consciousness of the deceased in the interval between death and rebirth. Yet prayers must be learned and preserved by the living. At Tami Monastery, its great library of Buddhist scripture must be read and taught each year. Once it was customary for one son in each family to become a monk. 
But with the growth of tourism, a young monk may well envy the Western clothing and wristwatch of a brother who has become a trekking guide. First encountered as a 12-year-old boy, the head lama again welcomes an old friend. With Peter and Mingma, Hillary has come to help preparations for Mani Rimdu, a yearly Buddhist festival to protect the Kumdu. I'm very well, thank you. Thank In the courtyard of the monastery, helped by bare-legged monks, Rex and the rest of the Hillary construction team are swiftly completing improvements on the paved court and adjoining structures. With time growing short, Hillary and Peter also join the crew. Soon the balcony and yard will be crowded with Sherpas and a few tourists who have made the pilgrimage over the steep mountain trails, some from villages many days walk away. With the sounding of horns, the great cycle of dances begins. As in the religious mystery plays of the Middle Ages, the Sherpas act out their myths, make theater out of faith. Often using the symbols of ancient beliefs in magic, the dancers again promise the victory of good over evil. In the Kumbu, every mountain has a spirit. Mani Rimdu exorcises the demons that threaten it. Backstage in the gompa, or temple, another ritual is taking place. Donning the sacred masks and costumes, decorated with an array of mythic symbols, men are becoming gods. For a little while, they will become the holy figures invented by human need. <laughs> Now, like a challenge, a crash of symbols demands the attention of the threatening adversaries. For it is in the dance of the so-called Eight Furies that the climactic struggle with the evil spirits occurs. In it, the benign gods rise in terrible wrath to defeat and drive away the demons. Thank you. 
Once again, the protective guards disappear into the Gompa. Once again, the villages are safe from demons for another year. As always, the people form a line to pass the Rinpoche, bring gifts wrapped in ceremonial katas. One by one, they are blessed, take a sip of two or holy water with a sprinkle on the head, then taste a bit of toma made of flour and butter. The ritual greatly similar to Christian communion with its wine and wafer. Yet watching the Rinpoche bless the people, Hillary remembers another visit when the head lama was a child and the Hillary family helped build a wall. On the western ridge above Kunde, Mingma's wife, Ang Duli, also remembers. In a more private ritual, she brings juniper to the shrine she and other villagers built long ago for Louise and Belinda Hillary. Yet even the eight furies cannot protect the Sherpa villagers from the risks of change. Once reached only by an arduous two-week walk over mountain trails, the distance from Kathmandu now can be covered by plane in less than an hour, provided, of course, that the Lukla airstrip, which bears some resemblance to a ski jump, can be found in the frequent overcast. Speaking a dozen languages, tourists from Europe, Asia, and America disembark from the aircraft, pass through the villages, alarming small dogs, awakening the merchants, and delighting the local children who have discovered the blessings of balloons and bubble gum. Today, the Kumbu is invaded yearly by thousands of trekkers and porters plodding the steep trails and spreading their bivouacs across the upper slopes like an occupying army. More ambitious are the expeditions intent on conquest. Since Hillary and Tenzing first reached the summit, nearly 150 men and women have stood on Everest. In Kathmandu, there is a growing list of other teams booking dates on which they too can attempt to climb Everest or a score of other peaks. Everywhere, the sound of the saw is heard. Hillary tells of its impact. I believe the problem of conservation in the Kumbu area is a very serious one indeed. There are literally dozens of small hotels being constructed with a view to supplying accommodation to walkers and trekkers and, and climbers. This has put a very considerable pressure on the local timber resources. 
In the old days, the Sherpas used to have very strict rules about where they cut firewood and how much they cut. And the whole society was well balanced ecologically. All that has changed. And nowadays, most of the upper valleys have been completely denuded and many of the forests have been thoroughly thinned out. As the Sherpas are learning, their mountain homeland is astonishingly fragile. Not only in the Khumbu, but throughout Nepal, trees are being cut at a devastating rate, one-third the nation's forest in the last decade. Already, ravaged slopes are bringing disastrous penalties. No longer held by trees, landslides are destroying terraces built by centuries of patient labor, have even swept away or buried entire villages. With the help of Hillary's Himalayan Trust, at least one resident is being banished forever from the Khumbu parklands. Relentless foragers of seedlings and low vegetation, goats long have threatened the slow-growing shrubs and trees of the high country. Now Hillary too joins in a great goat roundup with Mingma Norbu, warden of the Sagamata National Park on the flanks of Everest. From the scattered slopes, almost 500 goats at last are gathered near Namche Bazaar and driven to the less vulnerable lowlands in the south. At park headquarters, Warden Mingma Norbu leads an intensifying effort to save the Kumbu from calamity. A student in the first school built at Kumjung over 20 years ago, he is a proud example of the education made possible by Hillary. Now speaking both Nepali and occasional English, he teaches a new generation of Sherpa children to recognize the evidence of damaged trees and erosion on the scarred landscape around them. He stresses the critical importance of tree nurseries and the need for a wider program of reforestation, protecting not only their fragile world, but Sherpa culture itself. <laughs> Celebrated in a museum photograph, the climbing of Everest by Hillary and Tenzing hastened the changes taking place in Nepal. Now on the 30th anniversary of that historic event, the Kumbu is no longer an island lost in time. The past sends emissaries. Announced by the beat of drums, ancient protectors of their Tibetan ancestors appear amid the villagers assembled at Kongjong School. Believed to be the guardians of the four gates of earth, snow lions have come down from the icy summits to dance and cavort for the honored guests. While the conquerors of Everest sample the home-brewed chong of the village women, the school staff prepares a lesson on how mountains really should be climbed. As the guests should know, a little chong steadies the nerves, helps blur the dangers and difficulties that lie ahead.
helping hand is always appreciated. Pace yourself. The steeper the slope, the more rest you need. Try not to trip on a tangled rope. The fall may be farther than you think. When altitude sickness strikes, a whiff of oxygen can work wonders. When lost, look for the summit. That's where you're going. What's that? There's one very big stone. In the final assault on the last gale-swept ridge, don't lose heart. You must help to me. Hello, Sata. You must help to me. Hello, Sata. I'm ready. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. OK. Thank you very much. Celebrating one journey, Hillary begins another. From Kung Jung School, he leads a climb of children. Bearing seedlings of fir and rhododendron from Sagamata's nurseries, the students of Kumjung School are bringing back growth to the blighted slopes below Everest. Helped by Hillary as they commit roots to soil, they are part of a new children's crusade, not to seek redemption in heaven, but to renew life on earth. Around Hillary stand the silent witnesses of the journey he began long ago. Amada Blom, Kantega, Tom Serku, Everest. The summit where he and Tenzing once left a bit of chocolate and a few biscuits. Today, he has brought a richer gift, the small beginnings of a new woodland the little trees protected by the prayers of children. But the answer to prayers often lies in those who pray. In the opening minds of Kumbu's children lies a measure of their world to come. In them, Sir Edmund Hillary long ago found something more satisfying, more enduring than leaving a footprint on a mountaintop.
The tallest mountain in the world is one of rock and ice, of brutal winds and indifferent snows. Mount Everest. It has killed some of the world's greatest climbers. Over the years, hundreds have flocked to its base, hoping to reach the summit. But years and names and nations blur on the mountain, overwhelmed by one experience, the ordeal of Everest, where many climbers never come back alive, and no one comes back the same. It's a mountain that you regard uh, with considerable respect. I don't know anybody who has a feeling of affection uh, for the mountain. Before we leave, I tell them all that this is a high-risk venture. Are you aware of it? And if you mess up there, are your folks ready for it? You could climb it three times, five times, a hundred times. You don't conquer it, you survive it. There's deep sadness, there's sorrow, there's joy, there's excitement. There is all these things which make it something very, very big within your life. Well, gentlemen, welcome to the annual board meeting of British Everest Expedition Incorporated Limited. One can very easily, I think, get over impatient helping the expedition. In organizing a trip, the first key thing is to know clearly what your objective is. And this might sound terribly obvious, it's to go and climb a mountain, but it, it, it isn't always obvious because it's not only climbing that mountain, it's how you want to climb that mountain. And you've got to be very, very clear about that. If you get dinged over there, do you want to stay there? Uh, if uh, you get sick, will you still work and help? Uh, all of those things are discussed before we go. If you get a Dear John letter from your girlfriend, she said, I found somebody who's staying home, so when you come back, don't look me up. <laughs> it disrupts the team and destroys the morale of the team. At base camp, there's less than half the amount of oxygen that there is at sea level. And of course, as you get higher, it gets colder. Even getting to base camp, you think, God, how can I stand being in this cold? And obviously, it's going to get colder higher up. If there is a cold day, it's not 20 below, it's 40 below, 45, 50 below zero, Celsius. And this is hard for human beings. If there is a storm coming, it's much stronger because you're much higher up. Some people already will be sick by the time you reach base camp, eating the indigenous foods and getting those 3,000-year-old uh, bacteria in the stomach. Yeah, I never slept. So the altitude is being the, 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 the night before was OK. And, uh, you know, diarrhea and sick. So I don't know if you've got some bad, uh, some bad snow, probably. Every climb I've been on, some people have broken ribs from coughing up high because the atmospheric pressure is so less up there. A hard cough will break ribs. So that eliminates another uh, couple of people for a while. Well, some of it is luck. You've got to be in, in good physical shape. But more important, it's a matter of how badly do you want it mentally. The fact that either you or one of your companions may have the possibility of dying, it not only doesn't stop you doing it, but it's uh, almost uh, one of the things that keeps you going. It's such an overwhelming thing to do. The odds against you are stacked up so high that the only way one copes with the enormity of the project of climbing Everest is to break it down into manageable portions, bit by bit. Perhaps the most dangerous part of the mountain that is regularly traversed by climbers is the Kumbu Icefall, which makes part of the, the normal route, the original route, up Everest. What you have is this huge glacier that funnels into this very narrow area and then 
shoots out again and this tremendous pressure of ice from Lhotse and Everest pushing down into this. So there's ice towers and crevasses opening up and there'd be so much pressure that when one of them cracks, it sounds like this huge cannon going off. One, two, oh, Okay. Stop it moving. Each season as climbers come to put a route through the icefall, it involves using thousands of feet of rope up to a hundred ladders to, to span the crevasses and climb up some of the walls of the ice blocks. And even during the course of a few weeks, that route can change quite dramatically. It has to be rerouted. Parts of it become impassable. Most exciting ladders on the ice fall are these vertical ones. Oh, this one's a bit less. The, because the glacier's moving all the time, sometimes the ladders get a bit stretched out. This one is particularly loose. See how it's moving around? Not very stable. Quite exciting. <laughs> You can look up, maybe 2,000 feet above you, see a hanging glacier, but you won't know when that could break off. So you're going through what we call Russian roulette climbing, going through an ice fall could break at any time. You hurry through it and try not to go through it too many times. It's a beautiful place, but it's in the same moment like hell. It's a dangerous place. In 1978, on my first Everest expedition, we had one death sharper. The ice fall was shivering and in a second, a few holes uh, went up and he disappeared. Another one disappeared too, but he was still alive and he had a fracture on the head that we had two doctors with us and they saved him. The question of the morality of exposing Sherpas to risk is a very, very difficult one. More Sherpas have died on the mountain than any other group, but of course, in all fairness, more Sherpas have been on the mountain than any other ethnic group by a long way. The trouble is, though, the Sherpas also, they, they are exposed to high levels of risk over a long period of time, particularly, for instance, low on the mountain in the icefall, which is always a desperately dangerous place. There are objective hazards, like the ice falls and the lightning and things that are pretty hard to avoid. We accept those. Uh, the risk factor is there. But the uh, personal mistakes, we don't expect to happen. We think we're better than that. When somebody died, it's hard, it's, 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 a, it's a shock. But you don't think how it could happen. It happened. The fact that you think how it could happen and uh, we should not have gone to this expedition and so on, it's coming much later. Spend three months of your life, travel halfway around the world, play havoc with your health, lose maybe one of the best friends you've ever had, and you can't help eventually but sit on it sometime and and contemplate, was it worth it? Would I do it again? Women are as good as men or better in a lot of the high elevation climbing. They just hadn't done much, but Marty Hoey had. And so we picked Marty as number three in a team of 18 because she was that strong. Because when you go to six, you should pick out what you want. She was a professional climber and an incredible personality. She was a perfect teammate because she was always enthusiastic. She was insatiable as far as getting out and wanting to do things. 
Dave, Mayor, and I were up above putting in some fixed rope, and, and uh, Marty and Jim Wickwire were on a rock down below us. The weather was, was windy. Um, it was blowing out, uh, snowing intermittently, a little foggy. You, know, you could see someone, and then uh, you know, 10 seconds later, you didn't see them. And communication was difficult. I mean, it was like screaming. And I remember looking down, and I saw Marty stand up and over onto the fixed rope. Then the clouds sort of came in, and the clouds kind of drifted off. And Wickwire was the only one that was there. It's a steep wall. It's hard ice. The ice axe was planted, and she leaned away from the ice axe with a large pack on, probably a 45 to 50 pound pack, and leaned back. So she fell over backwards out of the harness. And as she accelerates immediately, the first attempt to grab the rope didn't succeed. And from then on, you're moving at uh, over 100 miles an hour uh, down a very steep wall. It was like I could sort of see Marty falling, but then it was cloudy, and, and it was sort of like, in your mind, you know, I suppose there's some shock involved with that because, you, you know, you're saying, I'm not really seeing what I'm really seeing kind of a deal. It's like, you know, this can't be happening, and yet it was. And we had decided before we left that that would be our preference, to be left on the Everest if any of us uh, messed up. And so we left Marty at that place and had a memorial service down below uh, for her. Accidents are usually caused by mistakes, and they're usually caused not by trying to do something desperately difficult, they're caused by that momentary loss of concentration and then an element of luck. It's just when, unfortunately, there's a thousand foot drop where you happen to trip. Marty knew that you always double back the seat harness, but there are times when you're without oxygen and are not thinking correctly. Oxygen dumb, we call it. Your body will adapt to uh, an elevation of around 18,000 feet, but above that, you'll uh, die a little bit each day. Feeling very lethargic up here. It's really very difficult to do anything. All you want to do is lie down, even that's hard work. Getting up and cooking yourself some food, making yourself, melting some water for a drink. One of the disconcerting things about being up high is that your conscious train of thought, which we like to think we have total control over, gets more and more slippery as you get higher and you get tighter. Well, it was blowing really good. It just killed me this morning. Got up, stumbled around, turned around. One of the first symptoms you, you get, apart from breathlessness, of being at altitude is a nagging headache, usually in the, in the back of your head. People become irrational. I just didn't have it. I got to go down. If I don't go down now, you can get on a rest cycle with the rest of these guys. They won't be an American in the summer team. They get pulmonary edema. It's like they've got pneumonia. Their lungs are literally stopping to work because they're filling up with fluid. They lose the interest in life. They lose the interest in going ahead. They don't need to speak about help or being saved. He's becoming so weak that he is sitting in the snow and says, you go ahead, I will die here. And in the first hours, somebody could also be saved easily, but you have to bring him down quickly. Without oxygen, we say the fire goes out inside you. Your extremities don't get enough oxygen, so the first things to go are the toes and fingers. 50 mile an hour winds, my hands kept freezing up. I couldn't get them unfold. Uh, so after about half an hour or so, uh, kind of madness, I turned around. You know it's happening, and you particularly know you're in trouble when that increased pain or discomfort in your fingers and your toes stops. 
and when it stops is when the tissue has actually frozen and that's where you have the major problems. You're trying to move your fingers and your toes and you're hoping that it'll go away. The pain goes away and you think, oh yeah, maybe it's done. But well, it probably isn't. Are your hands frozen now? No, no, they're fine. Oh, no, it's warmed them up. Yeah. My, my hands are freezing just here. <coughs> no, it was just because I had wet hands. First holding the tent up for aid so he could get his boots on. I'm trying to put my bastard boots on. And these stupid, bloody yeah. things. I just froze my hands twice. Yeah. I just lost all control. <laughs> uh, Brian offered me a cup of tea and I put my hands in it. <laughs> I was at 25,500 feet and I'd stayed there for four days. And so as a consequence, you do get cold and your rewarming process is, is real slow. You go from the outside into a cold tent. So my hands had gotten cold and remained cold and same with my feet. I made the decision to turn around and uh, one of the most difficult decisions I'd ever made in my life. The doctor said that uh, Larry would probably lose toes, more than toes and fingers. Uh, gangrene could occur if we played too long on this hill and that was a decision then to abort the climb. If Larry's toes and fingers hadn't been frozen, I think we'd have probably still kept trying, but uh, that meant that we had to get Larry off the mountain or we were going to have some more serious problems. Well, it makes you feel like an idiot to be carried out from a mountain, because I've never had a, a situation where I couldn't get myself out. You know, it's embarrassing, but it's also one of those things that happened on the mountain. The key thing, I think, in mountaineering is to listen to your instincts and listen to them very, very clearly. And it's your instincts, I think, that enable you to achieve but also keep you alive. And sometimes the instinct says, go on, even though it doesn't seem particularly logical. And at other times, everything seems to be going smoothly. And yet your instinct says, turn back, and then you should turn back. It's very easy to push yourself beyond your physical limits. I suppose this is where your fitness is very important. I mean, you, if your, your uh, ambition outstrips your physical ability, then you have problems. Your body basically says that's enough. It happened to me on my final summit attempt. The last two hours on the way up here, my legs start to shake and start to feel like 100 pound weights. I don't know what it is, it's a mineral deficiency or what, but uh, now I can hardly move my legs and they're still shaking. But they're shaking so much, they're making me feel hot. I've had to take my shirt off. It's snowing outside, it's a very thick cloud. I'll need to do better than this if I have to go any higher. The night before their summit bed, I didn't sleep much that night. I think it was partially that the whole expedition was at an end. There was nothing really I could do except just sit and wait. And so there was a sense also of, a, of I suppose, of a frustration, of impotence, that there was nothing you could do to actually affect the outcome. So there's that emotion of, of laying there the night before in your sleeping bag and, and thinking of all the historical background that's taken place on Mount Everest. When it comes right down to the day of doing it, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, to leave the South Call and get up up on that South Summit and the Hillary Step and all those famous places and see if I'm really up to the, the task of those places. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> I know you enjoy it. And then, of course, getting up the next morning and, and looking at it, saying, here we go. Oh, when I watch a summit team heading for the summit and I'm monitoring it, we're trying to know as much as possible about that climb because of the hazards that they are facing. Even on oxygen, mistakes can be made up there. We are sort of a safety net for them if we can consult with them and tell them what to do because you don't assume they know everything up that high. Well, you, may, 
you can make the leader very clearly. You can get the occasional flash as well of... Um... There's no way you can actually stop anyone once they're up on the mountain and away from everyone else. You can give advice, but no more than that. And there's no point ever in giving direct orders which you know you can't enforce. If somebody would tell me I was a member of an expedition, I was near the summit of Everest, and the expedition leader stopped me via walkie-talkie, I would only laugh and say, I don't believe it, this is bullshit, it's not possible. If you really had the ability and the willpower to go, you would have done it. This has been really, really hard going today. Very, very difficult. Don't ever want to do this again. Very, very hard. Above the South Coal, all I could manage was five or six steps before having to stop. Exhausted. I think what happens to you at high altitude is your more sophisticated levels of your brain, the conscious part of the brain, if you like, is gradually shut down as conditions get tougher and tougher. And as that happens, this other part of you, this older part, what I call our sort of two million year old part of ourselves, comes to the surface a bit more. And it's almost as if during that period there's, there's two of you. The higher you go on Everest, the more mental it becomes and the less physical and the mountain filters out some people and others go forward. I'll tell, I'll tell you, I wish my worst client was nothing like this. Everybody's a client I'm sure can do better than this on a given day. Windy? Windy. Very cold, strong, very cold. It's difficult. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. How you doing, babe? Good to see you. Tell me a little bit about it. It was terrible, terrible. <laughs> All of the groups, they are feeling weak. They feel it's dangerous. They feel exposed. And so the hope to survive is getting slower and slower, and we are all afraid to die. Fear can be quite a stimulating factor. If you overcome it, uh, it enables you to do things uh, often far beyond uh, what you thought was feasible. Well, I think there's two kinds of fear, really. There's firstly fear for yourself, which is this is a dangerous situation, go carefully. And it's a very important thing to have that feeling because it's a, a warning signal. The second fear, which I, I find much more difficult to cope with, is fear for others. Well, it's great to have a companion, your wife, at base camp. Hello, base camp, do you read me over? Loud and clear. It's um, pretty windy down here. What's it like up there, over? Well, I think mean, it's good coming up in the night, but uh, we had a lot of wind. Oh dear, well I hope tomorrow's going to be better than that. But so I now understand why then, eh? many climbers don't take their spouses. If you're down at base camp wondering how things are going up there, it's all too easy to worry. When I was going for the summit, my radio broke down. There was no way I could tell her what I was doing. And of course, she'd find it very difficult not to think of the worst. And to Tim, and to Tim. Do you copy me over? It's easy when you're coping with reality actually doing it. You're close enough to be able to see all the dangers, realise the tenuousness of the situation. Your imagination is a much more difficult thing to, to deal with. Ridge. It was quite a demanding uh, alpine ridge. If you fell down on either side, you would go for about 10 or 11,000 feet.
I couldn't quite make out where the summit actually was. And then I realised after I'd been going for some time that the ridge ahead dropped away and I could see away out in the distance the barren highlands of Tibet. And I looked up to the right and just 40 feet above me about was a rounded snow dome. You know, physically, I experienced a, an awful lot of problems. I had a, an ulcerated toe with the bone showing, an intestinal parasite. I lost 35 pounds in five days going to the summit. I had a, a clogging in my throat, and so to breathe, I broke two ribs, and then the pulmonary embolism just below the summit, where I was throwing up some blood. And, and so, you know, f there were a lot of physical things that were going on. And we walk up the summit, with a great feeling of relief, you know, as we were joking about, thank God the summit wasn't 50 feet higher. We hugged and got to work. Lute taking the first motion picture panorama from the summit and me doing the still photography. Just over there, Tibet. Mountains spread out all around, 600 miles to the south way beyond the clouds. The summit is only as big as the roof of a station wagon, and it's quite obviously the highest point anywhere around from horizon to horizon. The sky above is dark blue. In fact, you can see the planets. But this overwhelming feeling of r incredible difficulty, pain, suffering, is suddenly over. And it, it's difficult to, to really I said how important it is to be there. And I know instinctively I really wanted to stand on the highest point of Earth, as I think most climbers do. The greater thing about Everest is, is in people's minds. It will always be an enduring symbol, a symbol of, of hope and striving, achievement, of this great journey that we're all on, I think. There's a great quote from uh, Helen Keller on risk, and that is that security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children of men as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And now, a never-before-released interview with Sir Edmund Hillary. Uh, as I told you, we're going to be doing a film on the history of filmmaking. And in looking back to your expedition in 1953, how important was it to have a filmmaker with you? Well, I don't think we climbers regard it as important at all. Um, I mean, our main, main objective was, obviously, to try and climb the mountain. And uh, all the, the extra aspects, sort of media coverage and all that sort of thing, really didn't uh, count for that much importance in our view. So we did have a film cameraman along, and we thought it would be quite good fun to have uh, some shots of the mountain. But the idea of, uh, of actually uh, producing a film on the complete thing really wasn't important to us. Although now, looking back 45 years later, isn't that an amazing historical record of what you did? 
Oh, it is indeed. And, and of course, uh, we were, in a sense, um, not up to date in understanding the importance and the need uh, for effective coverage. But, you know, when uh, we uh, were attempting Everest, uh, we were by no means sure that we were going to be successful. Uh, we weren't uh, attempting the mountain in absolute confidence by any manner of means. For us, it was a big challenge. Uh, we were going to give it everything we had, uh, and we hoped, if all went well, uh, we might reach the summit. So uh, because you know, we didn't have this absolute confidence, I don't think we climbers, anyway, were so worried about the recording of it. Now, Tom Stobart and then you said George Lowe were the two filmmakers with you, and George was, of course, an amateur. How difficult is it to climb and film? Well, I think that uh, I think it's very difficult, actually, and uh, because it, you know, it adds a, a burden of the equipment that you've got to lug around. Uh, you do have Sherpas to help you with that, uh, but uh, you still have to use the uh, material and the equipment accurately at high altitudes when you yourself are short of breath. Uh, George Lowe, in particular, did a remarkable job. Um, he filmed on the uh, South Col at uh, 26,000 feet uh, just with a, a little uh, portable uh, Bell and Howell camera and, uh, and the results came out magnificently. One of the things I always remember was uh, I was emerging from a tent on the South Col and uh, George Lowe filmed it. And I saw this film back in London. And uh, I sort of came to the entrance of the tent and opened it and sort of stopped. And then I moved slowly out and stopped again and got up slowly and stopped and then uh, put my boots on and sort of stopped. And I thought, good heavens, there's something wrong with the camera. But actually, it was me that there was something wrong with. At that altitude, everything you were doing was all slow motion. Even though you yourself thought you were being normal, you weren't being normal at all. Well, you know, I've watched the film Conquest of Everest, and in it there's this scene where you are getting ready to leave, you and Tenzing, you're on your way up to Camp 8 to the South Call, and you're waving goodbye to everyone, and... Uh, you know, it reads in the narration that it's time to say goodbye just as you head up to the South Pole and all of New Zealand and the wishes of the world are with you. Do you remember that moment and what that was like? Uh, I do remember the moment when we left advanced base camp and Tenzing and I headed off up the Lochi face. Yes, I remember it quite clearly. Uh, to me, it wasn't really as dramatic uh, a moment as uh, you might expect. Um, we knew we were well acclimatized. Uh, we already had supplies in place on the South Col. And uh, although I wouldn't say we were confident of being successful, uh, we were quite sure that we were going to give it all we had. Now, of course, when you got up to the summit, there was no filmmaker with you, and you had the camera, which you took that unbelievable immortal picture of Tenzing. So here you were the filmmaker in effect. What was that like? <laughs> well, I, I was very much aware of the fact that uh, when we got to the summit, I not only needed to get a, a photograph of someone on top, which is obviously Tenzing, uh, but I also took photographs down all the leading ridges of the mountain to give absolute proof uh, that uh, we had got to the top. I knew it was a very disbelieving world. So I like to have a, a firm record uh, that we had actually got there. Now, since your ascent in 1953, there's been a handful of filmmakers who've climbed Everest, culminating in the recent IMAX film. And uh, you've seen it. What do you think of it? And what do you think of David Brashear's filmmaking? Well, I, I've been with David Brashear's on uh, a number of expeditions and have known him for a long time. He's an expert filmmaker and also a very expert climber which is an ideal combination uh, if you're doing shooting something on, on Mount Everest. I only saw the film actually a few weeks ago, and uh, it's impressive, all right? I mean, the, uh, the, the whole drama of everything is magnified enormously. And uh, even when we helicoptered uh, over the crevasses 
uh, of the ice fall. Uh, everything looked different, you know, it looked terrifying almost. Whereas when we were down on the surface, we were hacking steps, we were making uh, our way across the crevasses and up the ice walls, and it, it was closer, as it were. But seeing it from a helicopter was very dramatic indeed. Now, I think it's a great film. I would say that the, um, I felt uh, that uh, David handled the disasters on the mountain very delicately, and I appreciated that. You know, there could have been uh, far more drama and dead bodies and all the rest around. And, uh, and I personally thought that that was handled uh, very well indeed. Do you think that a film can ever capture the striking image that you have in your mind of Everest? And how do you feel about the attention these films bring to such a sacred mountain? Well, no, I think films uh, for the ordinary person who has no desire whatsoever uh, to climb on uh, a mountain like Everest. You know, being uh, high on a, on a big mountain is a fairly miserable sort of business. You know, you, you don't particularly enjoy it. Uh, you don't enjoy food. You're short of breath. It's hard work. And, uh, but I think that being able to sit in a comfortable seat and see a very, very dramatic scenes of all uh, these things happening, I think can be very exciting for people in general. And uh, you were born at a time when there were still so many wonderful challenges, uh, and now it seems like many of those challenges have been conquered. For young people today, what is the Everest of today? Are there any challenges left? I think there are a lot of uh, s smaller but very difficult challenges. Even on mountains, there are many uh, routes by which they can be climbed, which are far more difficult than the original ways, for instance, that we climb. And uh, I think you'll find, uh, if you're uh, talking to a group of experienced mountaineers and, and they say they've been to the summit of Everest, uh, you say to them, what way did you go? You know, if they've gone up to Southeast Ridge, which we first pioneered, that's one of the easier routes uh, on Mount Everest. Uh, but there are other routes on the mountain which are very formidable indeed. And I think the modern climber really wants to get to grips with those formidable ways up. And the last question, David Brashears was quoted as saying, Everest has this immense psychic gravity that pulls you into its orbit. In a dark and mysterious way, the deadly nature of the place has only strengthened Everest's grip. Do you think that Everest has, and the tragedy in 1996 has now made the mountain more alluring? Uh, yes, I think particularly in America, the um, publicizing uh, of the tragedies in 1996, I think has, has brought to the public here uh, what Everest is all about. For the first time, perhaps, uh, they have realized the problems, the challenges, the disasters, and almost everybody uh, has heard about it. And uh, David Brashears was just uh, saying to me a few days ago, uh, you know, a few years ago, if, if you mentioned the South Coal, Nobody would know what you were talking about. But now virtually everyone uh, knows where the South Coal is. So there have been enormous changes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.
alluring and beautiful. Over 20% of the Earth is crowned by white mountains, but the magic of the mountains may be luring us into harm's way. Every year, over a million avalanches strike with little warning. Traveling at speeds of more than 200 miles per hour, a small avalanche can be deadly, but a big one can be catastrophic. Meet some victims who have been buried alive but live to tell when National Geographic brings you Avalanche, the White Death. Everest. Man has conquered the mountain, but in its shadow, there are challenges yet to face. The challenge of its waters and its skies. Ten bold explorers and eight weeks of pure adrenaline. They'll take the plunge into the adventure of a lifetime. Through the most furious rapids that ever battered a kayak against the most spectacular backdrop that ever beckoned a pilot. National Geographic takes you on one wild ride. Join the Himalayan River Run. Think you have what it takes to brave Alaska? Where an average winter day could be 50 below zero and your closest neighbor could be 50 miles away. Where the mail only comes three times a year. But there are more recipes for moose than you can count. Sound tough? It is. But that's a small price to pay for independence. And you've got to be tough if you're braving Alaska.